everyone, and uh, welcome to the Scripps Research Institute and our 21st commencement. Uh, I'd like to especially welcome Executive Vice President Peter Vogt, Jamie Williamson, the Dean of the Kellogg School, our honorary degree recipient today, Professor Paul Schimmel, my faculty colleagues, both behind me here on the stage and those that are in the audience. There are members of the administration in the audience, welcome as well. Those are the formalities. Now to the really important people, to the parents and family members and friends of the, of the graduates today, welcome. And most importantly, to our degree candidates, welcome to your commencement. Um, at the outset, I want to do something that I did last year, which I, I think is important for us to recognize. The, uh, and that is to recognize the parents, the friends, the family members, spouses, partners, siblings, anybody who's here that is here because of the graduates in the front. We, how did they get here? Um, we will unabashedly take credit for their scientific achievements. Our, their faculty advisors, and if you've met them, you know they're not exactly a shy lot, and they will take credit for that, but they can't take credit for getting them here. Uh, they've given them advice along the way, I hope, uh, but often it's probably a phone call from you. Uh, maybe some money. Uh, you know that we do provide them with a stipend. Um, and, and it sort of covers the edges, uh, but they've probably needed your help along the way. Uh, you, maybe you sent them a care package with some cookies or just with a voice on the end of the phone. But we know that you were there, and we know that we couldn't be successful with them today if it wasn't for you. So I'd like all the PhD students to stand, turn and face the audience. I'd like my faculty colleagues to all do the same. And let's thank all of those that came here today. that and much more. We appreciate it and, and hope you uh, enjoy the day as much as we're going to. Um, this year, I, I, I mentioned one note of sadness that, that Sam Skaggs passed away. Uh, Sam Skaggs was a philanthropist, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. He and his wife Aileen made major contributions to many institutions that they believed in. And we are very lucky that Scripps was one of those. The Skaggs Institute for Chemical Biology is a living example of at least part of the Skaggs investment in the Scripps Research Institute, which totaled over $100 million, quite the, the largest single donor to the, to, the, to the Scripps Research Institute. So I'm immensely pleased today, the happier note, even though we will miss Sam, uh, is that we are establishing the Sam and Aileen Skaggs uh, Award for contributions to drug discovery that will be given to a graduating student. It honors Sam's commitment to pharmacy, to his commitment to developing drugs from basic discoveries. And so we're indebted to the Skaggs family, and we're happy to announce the establishment of that award, which will be given by Dean Williamson and, and the associate deans in the graduate school next year. So let me just say by further way of introduction, and then we'll move the proceedings along. Scripps is a unique institution. I make that claim on a regular basis. What's the basis for the claim? There is no other basic research institute, no other medical school that does basic research that runs the gamut of the very most fundamental chemistry through to the complexities of human biology. That spectrum of science that studied and carried out at Scripps is a unique blend that you will not find anywhere else. But there's a missing piece to the equation. The missing piece to the equation are the students. Once you take students, like those of you that are completing your degree today, and you put them in this cauldron of this wide spectrum of science, basically what my faculty colleagues and I have to do is simply stand back, get out of the way, and try not to tell you what to do. 
The breadth of the science that you'll hear about in these dissertations today reflects that breadth of science that's, that's taking place at Scripps. That's our unique element, and because of that, um, you are unique. So we depend on you. You're, you're the next generation that will go out and make the kinds of discoveries that there's a long list that have taken place at Scripps. We're going to watch you make those discoveries and very, be very proud of you in the process of doing that. You're stamped with Scripps indelibly today. Uh, we won't let you forget it. Uh, and so now let's get on with the rest of the day, and I welcome uh, Dean Williamson for his opening remarks. So good morning. I'd like to add my personal welcome to uh, the 21st commencement of TSRI. And I'm pleased to introduce our class of 2013. Uh, so this ceremony brings together many different groups of people, and I'd like to say a word to each of you. So uh, first and foremost, I'd like to echo uh, President Marletta's uh, welcome to the families. Uh, you have moms, dads, sisters, brothers, grandparents, uh, significant others that have come quite often from long distances to witness this. So we thank you for entrusting uh, us with your sons and daughters. Uh, graduate school is not an easy experience, and uh, we, we uh, ask each student to challenge themselves to the utmost of their abilities. Uh, the course of study is long and uh, sometimes very difficult in a variety of ways. And as scientists, we must learn to deal with daily failure because most of what we do, in fact, does not work. Now, graduation is uh, one of those times where uh, there's typical, typically a lot of quotations. And you know, in my view, uh, you know, people that use quotations basically have nothing to say themselves. So let me begin by quoting Winston Churchill. <laughs> Success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. So, to the families, you are now here witness to the successes of your sons and daughters, and some of you have no doubt wondered if this day would ever come. Uh, it's here, uh, and I hope you will enjoy with special pride this day. Uh, this is your day, and I would invite you now to celebrate with unrestrained enthusiasm. Let's give the class a hand. are not only tolerated, but are encouraged uh, at, at the appropriate times. Uh, so I would like to thank those in the graduate program, uh, in particular uh, our, our director, Melvin Rinaldi, and her assistants, Suzanne uh, uh, Russell and Mary Davis, and their efforts throughout the year, and in particular uh, for organizing this ceremony and the lunch to follow. Uh, we have a really talented group in the graduate office. Uh, Dawn Eastman is our director of education, and she has uh, a number of efforts in areas including our outreach program. Ryan Wheeler and Mike Matrone are uh, in the Career and Postdoctoral Services Office, and they have an, uh, an outstanding array of things that the students take advantage of. I would also like to acknowledge uh, our Chief Scientific, o Scientific Officer, uh, Peter Vogt. He works very hard on the behalf of the faculty to keep our science moving forward. Uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my associates in the administration, uh, of the graduate program in particular. Bill Rausch is here from the Florida campus and he is the associate dean. And in the past year, we've appointed two new faculty members as associate deans. So, and I'd like to welcome uh, Phil Dawson and Delia Fowler to the stage. Okay, to the faculty, thank you for your considerable efforts in advising and mentoring the students and being the most critical element uh, of the scientific enterprise at Scripps. Uh, and, and it's really critical for the educational mission of the graduate program. It's, it's no accident that we are ranked among the top 10 uh, programs in the country, and that distinction is entirely due to the research prowess of uh, my colleagues here, uh, the faculty. Uh, to Professor Schimmel, uh, it's a special honor for me to have Paul as the commencement speaker. He's been a mentor and a friend to me for over 20 years since the time I was a young Turk uh, at, at MIT. Paul, Paul always makes pertinent and pithy remarks about science business and life in general. And some of Paul's advice outlook 
have taken me uh, days, if not years, to fully comprehend. Uh, but I certainly view Paul as one of my academic fathers, and, and like my biological father, it seems that the older I got, the wiser he became. <laughs> so I urge you to listen closely to his words. To the current students, uh, each of you has to be looking forward uh, to this day when you'll walk across the stage. What does it take to be successful? Uh, studies of success in a wide variety of disciplines. It doesn't matter what it is. You're a concert violinist, uh, you do origami, martial arts, uh, theater. Uh, there's many studies that have tried to indicate what does it take to be successful at the highest level. And in his book, Outliers, this is my second quote, uh, Malcolm Gladwell writes, in fact, researchers have settled on what they believe is the magic number for true expertise, 10,000 hours. There you have it, the key to success. It's the key to becoming the world expert in your specific endeavor. That's what you get your PhD for. But let me paraphrase Gladwell. Every hour you spend outside the lab is an hour longer it takes you to get your PhD. <laughs> OK, so to the graduating class, you put in your 10,000 hours. We're extremely proud of you. Your families have assembled here in your honor, and uh, they too are proud. Uh, they're bursting with pride at your achievements on this uh, day of graduation. And to you, I have some good news and uh, bad news. Your days of endless toil for little credit and low pay are in an end. <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news is, soon you will turn back and look at these as the best days in your life. <laughs> So go forth to new positions and uh, take the next step to build your careers. We hope that Scripps has provided you with a stimulating environment to prepare you for that world. So finally, my third quote, the world's words of Ralph Waldo Emerson seem particularly fitting. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Good luck to you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it's, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker and our honorary degree recipient today, Professor Paul Schimmel. Paul is the Ernst and Jean Hahn Professor of Molecular Biology and Chemistry at TSRI. Prior to joining Scripps, he was the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics at MIT. Paul has published 400, over 450 papers in his career, and he's the co-author of a three-volume set in biophysical chemistry, which has been the standard for teaching biochemistry, uh, biophysical chemistry for many years. Paul, I'm happy to say that the volumes are still on my shelf, and I look at them every once in a while. <laughs> uh, Paul has been honored for his scientific contributions by election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Institute of Medicine clearly an indication of his impact and, and uh, uh, his impact on science. He's made many important scientific contributions. I want to leave the time for him to give his commencement address, so I'm just going to focus on the most important. During his career, he's worked on a class of enzymes known as tRNA synthetases. His laboratory discovered a universal process by which these synthetases correct errors in the interpretation of genetic information. This is a key fundamental aspect of life as we know it on this planet. I know there's some non-scientists here. Let me try and help you with an analogy. I think you know that all of the hereditary information in us is contained within DNA. That DNA just is a, a repository of information. That information has to be read out and read out perfectly. And if there are mistakes in reading it, that often will lead to disease. Uh, so how do, you, how do you have the system go without making mistakes? The information in DNA codes for proteins. So you've got to make the right proteins. Think of a protein being made in us, that's made every minute of the day, in every cell in our body, as a conveyor belt. And there's trucks that drive up. And let's say there's 20 trucks, and they're all a different color. 
And the information in DNA tells which color truck to drive up and dump its most important payload on the conveyor belt. Every once in a while, the wrong truck drives up and manages to deliver its payload. That would make the wrong protein. That would be extremely bad. Paul discovered early in his career how these TR tRNA synthetases fix that error once it's made. So the machinery isn't perfect, but Paul's contributions have figured out when it isn't how to make it perfect. That's one of his accomplishments. He's also noted for, for discovering what's known as the second genetic code. The first one was important. That was what was in DNA. I can assure you the second one is just as important. And while I'll spare you the details of that, know that contributions from Paul Schimmel's laboratory by Paul and his students discovered that second genetic code. You probably know, because you can't avoid it, that some number of years ago the Human Genome Project was completed, sequencing of an entire human genome. Technically, a very difficult feat. In 1983, Paul Schimmel described and, and discovered something called express sequence tags and shotgun sequencing. Those two techniques, without those two methods, the human genome could have never been sequenced. Nature in 2001 made note of that, made note of four crucial discoveries that allowed the human genome to be done. Paul was responsible for two of them. It's not enough. His long-standing interest in translational medicine has led to incredible applications in human health. Schimmel is the founder or co-founder of numerous enterprises that develop new medicines that have flowed out of academic research. Those enterprises have created new FDA-approved medicines, and the estimate is that over 100,000 people are alive today because of medicines that came from Paul's efforts in translational medicine. Now, that should be enough, and I should be able to stop there. But I have one more uh, point to make. Uh, like Jamie, I've known Paul a long time. I met Paul in 1978 when I arrived at MIT as a postdoc, so I have known him a long time. I've been president of Scripps for 16 months. In those 16 months, I can assure you there have been many challenges. I have asked Paul's advice repeatedly. He has never turned me away. His straightforward, honest approach to telling me what I was thinking of doing, even when he altered the path that, I greatly appreciate his wealth of experience. I rely on, and Paul, I have to say after today, don't think that this is sounding like it's the, you're off the hook. I will continue to beat your door down. So please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Schimmel to the podium. Thank you very much, Michael, for a very generous, perhaps over-generous uh, introduction, but uh, much appreciated. I'm honored and privileged to stand before you today, and the invitation to give this address came as a complete surprise, and when I was asked to present the address, I thought of three people. The first was Ernie Boyler. Ernie had actually given this address about five years ago. The late, great, much loved, much esteemed Ernie Beutler moved here in the 70s with his wife, Bonnie, and continued to develop and nourish their family enterprise while he built the Department of Molecular Medicine. Another person I thought of who died only three years after Ernie passed away for Steve Jobs. The third person I thought of was a singer from the 1970s, early 80s, a legendary singer and songwriter, Bob Seeger. And the fourth thing I thought of was a fox on an iceberg. My wife and I, when we were at MIT, had a summer home in Falmouth, south of Boston, about 80 miles. One winter day, we decided, a bitter cold day, a long streak of bitter cold weather with high winds, we decided to visit Falmouth. And we went out to a point of land, 
that projects into Vineyard Sound, looking south towards Martha's Vineyard, where you've got a six-mile waterway. The day was brutal. But we walked out on this point, and I looked out, and I saw a fox. The ocean was frozen. It was that cold, and it broken up into icebergs. And there was a raging tide, because at Penzance Point, there are some of the strongest currents in New England when the tide shifts. And the fox had walked out to find a piece of food, to find some game. And the ice broke off. And he was caught on an iceberg, roaring along, headed east in this raging wind. And I looked at that poor fox. There was nothing he could do. He was terrified. Absolutely terrified. And the lines came to my mind of that Bob Seeger song, Against the Wind, I Wish I Didn't Know Now What I Didn't Know Then. That fox had walked out to get some food and ended up being swept away in the ocean. Ernie Beutler, Ernie Beutler emphasized throughout his career and in his commencement address, the biggest danger to the script and to you as individuals is dogma and consensus because it will hold you down. It will keep you back from becoming what you really can become. Steve Jobs, before he died, said, life, my time is short. My time is short. What's the advice? If you live your life with other people's thinking, you will end up wishing you didn't know now what you didn't know then. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living the results of other people's ideas. This idea, this idea of following other people's ideas is deeply embedded in our culture and is a great, great danger. It also comes up in popular music. One of the popular songs of the early 1970s was a George Mitchell song, written by George Mitchell, called Never Kiss a Fool. It's a mournful song about a guy very much in love with a young woman, and they had gotten started together on a relationship and planned their life together. And then she heard from her friends, heard from her friends that this was not the right choice for her, that she could do better. Why is she going out with him? And she broke off the relationship. And he said, you should never kiss a fool because you will never find fulfillment and success unless you follow your heart. Steve Jobs went on. In his statement near the end of his life and said, what Ernie, often said, have the courage to follow your heart and your intuition, for only though they know what you truly want, who you truly are, and how you can find fulfillment. This message is probably the most important message that I can give today but also was captured in another song by Bob Seger, a second song. Because the most poignant concluding phraseology in the song Against the Wind, I wish I didn't know now, what I didn't know then, was the idea 
that when you draw the conclusion that you made a mistake, that you're in the wrong cultural environment, you've been following dogma and consensus, you will, you will have that feeling that I am surrounded by strangers that I thought were my friends. The whole point of Never Kiss a Fool. But Seeger had a second song to follow up on this idea. It was called Fire Lake. The lyrics are simple. The rhyme is simplistic. But if you read those lyrics, you read that rhyme, you will understand there is profound meaning on this topic. Who wants to play those eights and aces? Who wants a raise? Who needs a stake? Who's going to take that long shot gamble and head out to Fire Lake? your passion, who you are. And for some people, for some people, they come to that point where they've been following dogma and consensus. They're ground down. More poignant lines. Do you remember Uncle Joe? Joe was the one afraid to cut the cake. Who's going to tell poor Aunt Sarah? Joe's gone out to Fire Lake. The iPhone in 2007 was Steve Jobs' fire lake. All the dogma, all the consensus, which I well remember in 2007. Blackberry had the enterprise market. Nokia had all kinds of devices. Samsung was coming out of the box. The spokesperson, one of them, for the dogma consensus was Steve Ballmer the president, CEO, and chairman of Microsoft, in a famous interview in CNN in 2007, Farmer said, the iPhone is a $500 subsidized item. It's destined for total failure. Flash forward to 2012. Flash forward to 2012. The revenues each quarter for the iPhone alone, one product of Apple was greater than all products across all of Microsoft. Every Microsoft product did not add up to one iPhone. That was because someone followed the Fire Lake. Now, you might ask, how do I get out of dogma and consensus? And for that, I think of one of my colleagues at MIT, one of the mo most deeply spiritual men I have met in my lifetime. He was awarded a Nobel Prize for making what I will always regard as the greatest discovery of the 20th century, the genetic code. Karana often called me to have lunch with him at his office. At first, we used to have conversations about science. But gradually, the conversations at his leading would come to philosophical issues. One day, before I left MIT, only a week before, he asked me to have lunch with him once again in his office. He did something very personal. He went to his bookshelf. He took out some books. And hidden behind the books were slips of paper. He pulled out those slips of paper. And they were quotations quotations that had moved him, that he wanted to share with me. Now, Karana was someone I greatly admired because he never followed dogma and consensus. He was always on a fire lake experience. After he won the Nobel Prize, he completely shifted fields of science, had another great career, dropped that after many achievements, and then started a third career very successfully, which is mostly what people know, for, know about him today. And I asked myself, what did I learn? If you sum up all that he had in those quotes in my talking to him, it was perhaps his favorite quote from T.S. Eliot that kept him from dogma and consensus and kept him also moving ahead on his fire lake. It was, be still 
all still moving. In the modern vernacular, in the context of movies, sometimes very silly movies, you start to see elements of this sort of thinking come in. One of the best is what you might call a silly movie, most of you have never seen it, because it was in the early 70s, called American Graffiti, about the teen cult culture in the last days of innocence in the Central Valley of California, east of San Francisco. A lot of actors in there when they were very young. Harrison Ford, Cindy Williams, Richard Dreyfuss, and this carefree, easy life, the culture just sweeping people up into a kind of purposelessness. Eventually, there was a bittersweet enemy. But in that movie, there was a scene which I'll never forget. Harrison Ford, a young Harrison Ford, as all the guys did in that era, in his car, picking up girls and just picking them up, <laughs> comes up to a young Cindy Williams, who in this movie is called Laura. His name is Bob. And he pulls up and he says, hey, hey, Laura, what do you say? He wants her to get in the car with him. And she looks at him. And she says, she says, if you don't say anything, we'll get along just fine. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are. The scripts. A scientific powerhouse. Over 600 papers published here last year. And what is the fire lake of the scripts? It's knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. We create knowledge, we teach the knowledge we create, and we try to transfer that knowledge to society to make this a better world. And in the process, we have a huge, much unappreciated, particularly in the current environment, humanitarian impact. I spoke at a meeting last year in Boston. And a woman came up to me after my talk, and she said, I was very moved. You said something, I think, that she had never thought about, connecting science with the humanitarian <coughs> impact. I told the story of Lavina Warren. Lavina Warren lived from the middle 19th century into the early 20th century. She was a dwarf. She was 32 inches high, weighed 29 pounds. Can you imagine, you yourself, being 32 inches high and 29 pounds? Can you imagine your social isolation, your self-esteem? that you can't get rid of, you can't change that. What do you do if you're a dwarf? Well, you could work in a circus. You can be an oddity. You can be like a giraffe, or a monkey, or a baboon. And then I thought forward to the 1970s, the recombinant DNA era. We know Lavina had a particular type of dwarfism that can be treated with human growth hormone. And it became possible to treat all such children who had her particular genetic defect with recombinant human growth hormone, a pilot project that was very successful and then took hold at Genentech. Now imagine children with cleft palates, people who are crippled, people who have other deformities or diseases that they don't want, they, they really don't have any responsibility for. And yet we have an enterprise here that changes those lives. Huge humanitarian impact of what goes on here. The scripts over the last 10 years has at least six medicines that are now actively being used in patients. Treating hemophilia, various blood cancers, various types of autoimmune disorders, hereditary amyloidosis, 
and a new treatment for infant respiratory distress syndrome. There are 27 other medicines being tested in humans right now. This is what the Scripps is about, changing society. Jobs had his iPhone, which had a huge impact on the way people do their emails, make their phone calls, watch their videos, do social networking. But our Fire Lake is the deepest needs of humanity. One of my colleagues at MIT developed a new medicine, which is now actively being used in Los Angeles County at 13 different sites for keeping drug addicts and alcohol and alcoholics stable and losing the desire for the buzz without making them sick. There's an effort here in two laboratories at the Scripps to vaccinate people to treat this enormous social problem. I have sat with the Dalai Lama, with Octavio Paz, a Nobel laureate Mexican poet, with a Jewish rabbi, with a Catholic priest, with a Protestant clergyman, and with a patron of the arts, Dominic Di Menil, all humanitarians. They don't understand. They are trying to connect science with something in the theology or the poetry. They don't understand the humanitarian impact. And I asked them, I said, answer me this question. If there's a child dying in the home and a priest has been called in to administer the last rites and a young woman from the script shows up and says, look, I got a new experimental medicine. You have nothing to lose. Can I treat it, your child? I have no approval for it. You're in a village in Mexico so no one is watching anything and you inject that child and she recovers. Now I ask you, I asked these humanitarians, I said, now you tell me, who had the greatest humanitarian impact in this circumstance? Of course, people want the love and support of our religious leaders. We need it. And the poetry and the literature that uplifts us. But most fundamentally, we change human lives by following a rational, systematic approach that leads to saving people in many ways, not just their lives, but their behavior. So here we are, graduating a new class of wonderful people who I'm very proud of and very proud of our administration. All that's been done. And what's the next person who comes to my mind? Ernie Boitler, Steve Jobs, Bob Seeger, Fox on an iceberg? No. I've got one more for you. One more. Xiang Yu. A very famous military leader in China over 2,000 years ago. He was famous because he could beat the odds. He was known to overcome challenges where he was outnumbered 10 to 1. Now you know, if you're outnumbered 10 to 1, the troops are going to say, look, the dogma and consensus is we better get out of here. But he prevailed. And historians and others have been asked as they read about what is written and known about Shanghai. What did he do? One statement, one sentence. I shut off all exits for my troops. His fire light was inculcated in them passion. Passion. And if we ever lose our passion here, we are going to recede into dogma and consensus. Every group leader, every department head, every professor, and our administration must always remember that once we fall into dogma and consensus, we will become mediocre. It is the passion, our fire-like passion,
that moves us ahead and has this huge impact on humanity. Thank you. Um, is now, we now come to the part of the program for the conferral of the degrees. These candidates here in front have completed all the requirements for the Doctor of Philosophy degree or a Master's in Clinical Investigation. Upon the recommendation of the faculty of the Kellogg School of Science and Technology, it's my pleasure, extreme pleasure, to present them to you for the conferral of the degree. in clinical investigation, please stand. Uh, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Scripps Research Institute and on the recommendation of the faculty of the Kellogg School of Science and Technology, I hereby confer upon each of you the Master's in Clinical Investigation degree. Graduates, you may now move your tassels to the left side of your mortar boards. Congratulations. <laughs> Will all the degree candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree please stand? By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Scripps Research Institute and on the recommendation of the faculty of the Kellogg School of Science and Technology, I hereby confer upon each of you the Doctor of Philosophy degree. Graduates, please move your tassels to the left side of your mortar boards and congratulations. Will Professor Paul Schimmel, candidate for the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa, please stand. As has been noted in these proceedings, um, family members in attendance have been singled out for their uh, attendance, and I would like very much to acknowledge Cleo Schimmel, who's in the audience. Cleo and Paul have been partners since they met at Ohio Wesleyan, so some number of years ago. And we're very happy that she's here today. I've also noted earlier in these proceedings the accomplishments of Paul Schimmel over his career to date. In total, these accomplishments truly stand alone and without equal among many mountains here at Scripps, and for that matter, over the entire scientific landscape. This degree is awarded for Dr. Schimmel's exceptional achievements in science, leadership in translational medicine, and steadfast dedication to the Scripps Research Institute. Professor Paul Schimmel, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Scripps Research Institute, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science Honors Causa, which admits you to the rights and privileges of this degree. I ask Doctors Dawson and Rausch to place the hood on Professor Schimmel. <laughs> 